Word Creation Fellowship. Um, as you guys come in and you know, start our service. But before we do that, let's give this time to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, I'm coming for you today, Lord, just wanting to learn about you, to learn more about you. We thank you, God, for your mercy and all that you are doing in us and through us. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us, Lord, but we also thank you for the hardships because we know you use it all to mold us to who you created us to be. I pray, God, that you may be glorified today through, through singing, through the preaching of your word, through fellowship, and through prayer. In your name I pray, amen. As you all stand and please sing with me.
your worship. We have a couple of things. Uh, number one, if you notice your bulletin, we have a welcome to Harbor. Uh, even if you're part of us and have been here for ages, it's in there. If you have a prayer request to fill out, just put it in there and drop in the offering plate. I see those. I pray over those and things. So I uh, want to hear back, feedback, and things for you. Uh, we have our regular uh, ministries. Tomorrow we have our live members Bible study going through the book of Ephesians, still in chapter 1. And then Wednesday we have prayer lifters. We have prayer lifters, a time of, of prayer and a, a Bible study. We have a youth group uh, meeting Wednesday, a grocery a giveaway that, that we feed 100 people in the community and provide food and things for them. So it's just great that uh, you're here today to worship God, to, to, to worship God and to seek His face and to hear His word preached. I have a message uh, from the word of God from my sermon series, The Words of Christ in High Death. It's all through the summer's message number nine. And wouldn't you agree with me that what Christ said matters? It's the Word of God from the Son of God. Amen. God the Son, the Son of God. It really matters. And He's speaking to us, to our hearts. So we'll dig deep in that and do a deep dive on that passage of Scripture for this morning. Well, 50 years ago, a day ago, something happened. We had a man on the moon. Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon, planted a, an American flag on the moon, and uh, just, you know, something that was deemed impossible. John Kennedy, early in his administration, in his speech said, we have a goal, to send a man to the moon and bring him back safely. And uh, we did that. So kind of want to reminisce a little bit about what happened 50 years ago yesterday with the three Apollo 11 astronauts. And some of it I'll have in my message because a Bible verse from my message ties in. But when the moon, the, the, the thing landed on the moon, the lunar module, Buzz Aldrin, one of the three astronauts, first thing he did is he brought with him a small little communion packet and he celebrated the Lord's Supper on the moon. Amen. And uh, Buzz Aldrin was a Presbyterian ordained elder and uh, he wanted to honor God and, and things and uh, it's interesting one of the scriptures that he quoted on the moon is part of the sermon scripture today. But let me tell you a great, great story about our Apollo astronaut program. And this is so cool because it talks about how the scripture is the inerrant, inspired word of God. Amen. And so I was preaching some meetings in Houston and uh, was around these Johnson Space Center engineers and rocket guys and... Uh, and things and uh, we had a Bible study fellowship group and things and I got to be a part of that and we were talking and they said that here's one of the most amazing things he said first of all you'd be surprised how many people in the NASA program and Johnson Space Center are Christians they're, they're Christians and they're believers and then he told me that that they had figured out for the past 5,000 years every position of every star and planet in the galaxy and you know and i thought wow and they said that they would have to have a perfect positioning of everything for when the apollo 11 crew came back when they would get slung back towards the earth that they had a very tiny dinky small little window if they missed it the ship would go on to infinity and burn up so they did their research or calculations, and of course the computers they used was weaker than the, this thing that you have in your pocket was weaker back then. Uh, and so uh, I think that was only 64 gigabytes, and we have way, way more of uh, uh, things. But they said that they couldn't do their calculations right. There was a missing gap. There, there was a missing gap, and they ran it over and over and over again going past. 
And one of them said, wait a minute, I, I think I know why. They said that uh, I remember going to vacation Bible school and there's a story in the Bible about a war when the sun stood still. And I think that's a joke. So they got a Bible and looked it up and sure enough the story uh, of that battle and when the sun stood still. And they, count, they redid their calculation and configurations and they were almost at perfect similitude. But they were still, they still couldn't get it together. And they were fighting it, looking at it, and computing for days. And then another one of the engineers said, wait, I think I know the problem. There's a story in the Bible about a king when the sundial shadow got set back 15 degrees. Story of Hezekiah and God's promise. So they ran the calculations. They, they ran the calculations. And then guess what? They had perfection. And they were able to have them all the planets and stars and this and that in the right position to guarantee that when that Apollo 11 capsule coming back is slung back into the Earth's atmosphere that they would not bounce off and go out in perpetuity out there. And so the, the lesson there is the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Amen. And the NASA engineers and scientists validated the scripture. Now, God needs no sponsors. Amen. But the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God. Amen. And we can trust it. And even our NASA scientists, even them, used the scripture to make sure that those ashmas came back safe. Well, let's stand together. I, I've talked too long. Let's stand together and walk in and greet one another and then we'll worship some more and then we'll hear the word of God. You must be one <laughs>
Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of John, chapter 15. And uh, while you're searching, let me welcome all our viewers online uh, through our Facebook page, our YouTube page, and then uh, future archives on our website. I want to welcome you. If you're within a 30 mile radius of 92630 zip code, come and join us next Sunday, 1045. Uh, come and uh, worship with us alive. So, Open up uh, your Bibles, please, your device, your cell phone, and Google John 15. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 5. I'm doing a sermon series on the words of Christ in high depth. The words of Christ in high depth. The immediate context or location is what is captured in John 14, 15, and 16 often known as Christ's upper room discourse. He said some words in a close, intimate setting with his 11 disciples. We knew Judas betrayed and bugged out, and so he's talking there. But I want us to understand also that he's talking direct, face-to-face, heart-to-heart to you and I. Just imagine that you're sitting across that table and Jesus is quietly and calmly Speaking, He's not, you know, doing the roaring, loud preaching that he did on the Sermon on the Mount. But he's talking intimate, heart to heart, heart to heart. And you know, God often communicates in those two ways to us. Sometimes through the thunder and things and loudness and uh, maybe a, a passionate vocal sermon by a preacher. And then other times like Elijah experience in the cave. Through the still small voice. We, we just know. We, we just know he's speaking to us. The words of Christ in high definition. John chapter 15. Verses 1 through 5. Jesus said. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser or husband. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. He takes away. And we're going to visit that. It may not be what we've always thought. I may be either totally dead wrong on this, or you'll get some new insight that you never thought of before. We'll see what the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts on this. But he says in verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes or cleanses or makes more effective. I remember my father used to like to grow roses. There where we, I grew up in San Jose in the front yard. He had a whole row up the side of the driveway. All these beautiful roses. And then I remember coming home from school one day. And all there was were those ugly looking roots and branches. And I thought, Dad, what did you do? But I didn't realize that to have beautiful roses, there needs to be pruning and cutting out and cutting out some things. And... For you to know that God loves you and deals with you and wants to use you, he does it sometimes through pruning us. And it's not always fun. Sometimes it's a pain. I call it heavenly sandpaper. <laughs> heavenly sandpaper. I don't know if they still do wood shop or metal shops anymore in our high school, but uh, when I was a student in high school for our wood shop class, we had a class project and I was going to make a jewel box for my mother. And, you know, I, I thought I did a great job. I thought I had everything together. It didn't wobble after I glued and nailed it, and the cabinet door came open real well. And I turned it in, and the instructor came back, and I got an F. I got an F. <laughs> I, you know, I said, what in the world? And he says, that, that's a great job, almost perfect, but you forgot one thing. You forgot to sandpaper some of the edges. So I'll tell you what, you sandpaper it, you're going to get an A. So I went ahead and sandpapered the edges. What I'm trying to say is uh, there are times that God sandpapers the edges in our life. Amen. Just make it smooth unto Christ's likeness. Often it's called pruning. And here he talks about the vine and the branches. Uh, we are the branches of the vine. And that there are times that uh, we need to be pruned. It literally means to be cleansed. It means cleansing. 
And I'll give you the, 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 pinch, the pictograph, since we're so visually oriented now, I'll give you the picture in your heart and, and mind on this. He proves so that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. There's something about the word of God that cleanses us. When we study it, read it, apply it, thy word have I hid in my heart, Psalm 119, 11, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word I have treasured, literally in the Hebrew, I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And every once in a while, like laundry, it needs to be cleansed. And we need a cleaning and a cleansing through God's word. Verse 4 and 5, let me finish up. Abide in me and I in you. So he's talking up in that upper room softly and generally to the eleven and to you and I. Hey, abide in me. Come on, stick with me. Uh, modern language, hang in there. Just hang in there with me. Hang in there. One of my spiritual gifts is the gift of hanging out. Just, just hanging out. Being salt and light for Jesus Christ in a world where there's no light. He says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. And then here's one of the most beautiful verses in the Gospel of John. Once again, one of the seven I am verses. I'm not going to take a lot of time on the I am. But you need to know that whenever Jesus says in John's Gospel, and he identifies himself to an object we can understand, like, I am the door, I am the bread, I am the vine, that I am, he is declaring that he is God. Not just a divinity, not an angel, not something that became God or was adopted by God. He is the eternal Son of God, the eternal God the Son, and the eternal Son of God. He was from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. To eternity past, we have the Trinity, the Godhead, interrelating with one another. And more specifically, uh, when he says, I am, Jesus is relating himself to the I am of the burning bush. That's the book of Exodus. By the way, for those of you that want deep Bible scholarship and some deep Bible teaching and, and you love the depths of God's word and, and you've been in God, John's outline, this is fascinating, the outline of the Gospel of John is based on the book of Exodus and on the tabernacle. As you go through the book of John, you are actually going on a guided tour of the old tabernacle in the book of Exodus. You walk in and uh, to the tabernacle and you see the showbread, the table of bread. In Hebrew it's called the bread of the presence of the face of God. And Jesus Christ is the face of God. So you see the table of the bread, then you look this way, and you see the lampstand, and when you go through the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, you see Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. In chapter 8, I am the life of the world. I can go on and on, but I won't. But I, I want to just focus on this I am. I am. When Jesus said, I am, and John the Baptist said, I am not. Kind of interesting there, because they all thought he was it. And he says, I am not. I am. The story goes back to chapter 3 of the book of Exodus. And the story is about the very first fugitive. I used to, as a boy, watch the TV show, The Fugitive. Maybe you remember seeing it, black and white, the TV show, The Fugitive. And it was Dr. <coughs> Richard Kimball being chased by Lieutenant Gerard. And, you know, I thought to myself, Lieutenant Gerard had to have been the most incompetent man in the world. I mean, three or four years, he let Dr. Richard Kimball slip out of his fingers and not capture him. And there was David Jansen, you know, the fugitive. Well, there was a fugitive before the fugitive on TV. Moses was a fugitive. He ran from Egypt after he killed an Egyptian. He was a big mucky muck in the Egyptian government. It was said 
that if he played his cards right, he could have been the next Pharaoh or the co-Pharaoh. But he forgot that he was a Jew, he was a Hebrew, and then God reminded him, and he didn't like the oppression of the Egyptians on the Hebrew slaves, and uh, one day, uh, an Egyptian was hassling a, a, a Jewish guy. Moses stepped in between, and Moses killed the Egyptian. The scripture says he looked this way, and he looked that way, and then he killed the Egyptian. He was living by sight, not by faith. Do you live by sight, or do you live by faith? Or a combo of the two. Well, Moses, uh, you know, killed the Egyptian. Now, Moses thought he was slick. Nobody knew, nobody saw, and he buried the dead Egyptian in the sand. And the next day, a couple of Jewish guys were arguing, and Moses stepped in, and one of them said, Hey, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses dropped everything and ran away and hid in the backside of the desert and was a fugitive. He was number one on the Egyptian FBI list. Public enemy number one. And so he's been out there as a shepherd uh, there in the backside of the desert. And one day he sees the side, a burning bush. Now he'd seen that a lot. Lightning strikes and whatnot and acts of nature. But what was so unusual? How about this? And then God Moses' full attention was the bush was burning but not consumed. It was still burning and burning and burning. And then all of a sudden, he hears a voice, take your shoes off, you're standing on holy ground. Amen. Moses did that. And uh, the bottom line is, God was commanding Moses to go back to Egypt. He said, all the people that are hunting you are, are, are all gone. It's a new generation. Go back to Egypt and set my people free. Moses didn't want to do it. He said, who me? Who, who me? And uh, you know, interesting, Moses said, who me? Jonah said, not me. Habakkuk said, why me? And uh, Isaiah said, hey, me. There in Isaiah chapter 6, when the Trinity says, who shall we send? In your English Bibles it said, here am I, send me. But in the Hebrew, it's only two words. It's, hey, me. And you know what? Those four responses are the four responses every one of us makes before God in one way or another. Comes to teaching a class, doing a ministry, helping out, you know, here, here. Uh, it's either who me? Not me. Uh, not, not, not me. Oh, why me? Hey, me. Yes, Lord. Use me. Here am I. Send me. Moses was reluctant. Moses was and you know, to be a little reluctant prophet or to be careful and, and all that on, on some things with God, I think is a good thing. Instead of impetuous jumping into some crazy thing where we don't know what we're doing, it, it's always a healthy thing at, at times, I'm saying, to be cautious. So Moses says, okay, 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 okay. But then he goes, well, wait a minute. Who do I say that sent me to set the people free? What's your name? God, what's your name? And God says, I am. I am that I am. I am. And in Hebrew, the words I am is pronounced Hayah. Hayah. That's where they get the name, the proper name of God, Yahweh. So, back to Acts, back to uh, John 15, and back to the upper room, and when Jesus said in John 5, 15, I am, he is identifying with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, and it is the book of John that presents Jesus Christ as God. Matthew presents him, one of the four Gospels, Matthew presents him as a perfect king whose genealogy goes back to David, the first real official God's choice of king, and back to Abraham, who I call the first super Jew. Mark presents Jesus Christ as a perfect servant, written from the Roman mind. Luke presents Jesus Christ as perfect man, 
written to the Greek mind who, through their philosophy and so-called wisdom and knowledge, always were looking for, you know, perfection, the statues of Adonis and Venus de Milo back when she did have arms. Then it, it was a profession. Jesus is a perfect man. And John presents, John's a totally otherworldly, other, totally other gospel compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, Bible students call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptics, S-Y-N-O-P-T-I-S, because sin, the same optics, they see the, the same outline. John's completely, totally different because it presents Jesus Christ as perfect God. Jesus is all that we need, nothing else. He is perfect king. We have a leader and a kingdom. He is perfect servant. He served man to die on the cross. He is the perfect ideal, the perfect man, and best of all, the perfect God. As man, he knows my need, and as God, he is able to meet my need. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our one who said, I am. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. So, the title of my message is The Normal Christian Life. The Normal Christian Life. What is normal? You've heard the term today, maybe in the business context, maybe in the church context, you know, the, what is called the, the new normal. You've heard the term, the new normal. And, and the, the new normal may be new, but most of the time it, it ain't normal. It, it is weird out there. What is the normal Christian life? This passage, John 15, 1 through 5, I call, it is the normal Christian life. God's word determines what is normal. Not tradition or ancient history or Oh, well, that's the way we've always done it, Pastor. That's normal. It may not be normal in the eyes of God. Normal is what God says and God's Word says is normal and ought to be. Ought to be. So we see the new normal, the normal Christian life, which is the forever normal. This normal Christian life is not just for the superstars, the super saints, the, the deep spiritual ones. The leaders and the, it is for every believer, Amen. for every Christian, the normal Christian life. And so when I taught homiletics and preaching at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, sometimes I used to call it cemetery, uh, Baptist Cemetery, uh, I taught a preaching class, introductory and advanced, and I would train my students to, if they had like a 40, 30-minute sermon, you know, with, you know, four, five, six, eight thousand words, I taught them to condense it into one sentence. If you can condense it into one sentence, then it's not going to be scrambled egg. It's going to be a nice proportionate omelet, so to speak. So, this sermon this morning, on the normal Christian life, Jesus the vine, we're the branches, here's the one sentence that summarizes it up. The normal Christian life involves abiding in Jesus Christ. The normal Christian life comprises of hanging in there with Jesus Christ. From Him, we get the sustenance and the nutrients in what they call in biology, the xylem and phloem in our spiritual life. So let's take a look of the picture and productivity of the vine and the branches. Two big issues right here I want us to look at. Number one is identity, and number two is integrity. Identity and integrity. Overall, these five verses talk about our identity in Christ, which means looking like Christ. Who we are in Christ but mainly looking like Christ. And for people, at times, good times, wonderful times, not being able to tell the difference between us and Jesus Christ in our life, our words, our actions, our lifestyles, the way we talk, the way we walk, 
uh, the way we respond. Because uh, here's the thing. Now, here's the thing. Now, we're talking about the vine and the branches. Now, we know the vine produces grapes. Every once in a while, we'll have grapes out on our uh, fellowship bar and uh, family time together at Clean Church and Sunday School. It's a great time of meeting new people and mingling and, and having some snacks and things and, and all that. But uh, we know a little bit about grapes and things. And uh, so what I'm trying to get at is when I was a child, my mother and father, of course, grew up in San Jose, California, uh, for vacation, they used to love to go to a place called Calistoga. Calistoga in Northern California. And they'd stay a week, they would take in the spas and the thing, but they always, also, uh, that was wine country, Napa wine country, and they'd go to the wine tours, and you know, and so uh, I would, they'd show us the vineyards and things, and uh, then a friend of our family that I hung out with a lot, that my mother and father used to go play cards with and have drinking parties with and stuff, nice people and stuff and, and, and all that, but uh, uh, they had actually in their backyard a grape plant growing grapes. And I remember, you know, observing those. So what I'm trying to get at, at a long valley, <laughs> is that sometimes on a vine in the branch of a great plant, you can't tell where the vine ends and where the branch begins. They all look the same. And the normal Christian life, we look like Jesus Christ. We have Christ-likeness lived out in our life. We're not something different than what God is. We're not something different. We are God's branch. And I don't have the time to go into the branch. But four times in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is called the branch. And each of those four times relates to one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we see the identity. The identity. But then we see the integrity. The integrity. Now, integrity actually comes from a mathematical word, the word integer, which talks about wholeness. And literally, to have integrity means that one is not conflicted, not divided, one is complete, and one is together. To put it on terms that we can understand, it means we're the same person on Sunday that we are on Monday in the marketplace. Amen. We're the same person on Sunday that we're are on Friday night or Saturday night. There's this non-confliction, this non-dividedness. We're, we're complete, we're together, we're like that mathematical term, integer, wholeness. We're at one. We're not conflicted and divided into 20 different pieces. You know, Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, this one thing I do, this one thing I do to glorify, honor, Christ. this one thing I do. He didn't say, these 20 things I dabble at. Brethren and sisters, are, are you a dabbler? You, you can't get anything done or focus because you've got 20 things going in. You're like the juggler in a circus, balancing all this, you know, and, and uh, you, uh, focus. Focus. Focus on the vine, the sustenance, and have identity with Christ and integrity. Some things that we see here in this passage, uh, we see our connectivity, our vitality, uh, our life comes from Christ. And the branches and the fruit and the grape and uh, uh, the life comes from the sustenance and vitality. By the way, it's cultivated. That's why I would be hoping that eventually we'll be having some discipleship ministry and discipleship training beyond the great Bible study small groups that we have in our Sunday school ministry. Some great stuff, some great teachers. And th that's a place where we are cultivating hearts and lives. And uh, it's what you learn after you know it all that really matters. Right, folks? It's what you learn after you know it all that really matters. And you learn some new things about God, some freshness, some new things. So, we see here our connectivity. We're connected to Christ. That is the normal Christian life, that we are connected, not disconnected. We live today, even in our evangelical ways, in a 
great circles of disconnection. Everybody's a maverick. Everybody's a loose cannon. They're doing their own thing when God wants them to do God's thing. We, we see some of that, but there's connectivity to God, connectivity in the body of Christ to one another. We love one another. There's 58 one another's in the New Testament. Love one another, serve one another, lift up one another, encourage one another, and 54 more. I'm not going to take the time to go in and maybe I'll do a sermon series for four weeks called The One Another's. We're to be connected to God, connected to one another, connected to His house, His family, God's church, His invention, and His intention. We're to be connected. We see connectivity, we see vitality. Our life comes from Christ Himself. Notice verse 5, without me, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do anything, but we can't do anything of eternal value, of anything that changes people's time and eternity for the glory of God. Without me, you are nothing, and you can do nothing. Let's go back to Apollo 11 and 50 years ago, and one day, the trip to the moon by our Apollo 11 astronauts. Once again, Frank Borman uh, was part of that, all those groups. James Irwin, who I met, was a Southern Baptist who walked on the moon. And he was so impressed by what he saw and the, the presence of God that he quit the NASA program and became an evangelist. He started a group called High Flight. High Flight, and I met him when he speak, uh, spoke at Melody Land Christian Center way back in the dark ages. And uh, there was also another dynamic astronaut by the name of Charles Duke. Charles Duke, now most of these uh, astronauts were Navy or Marine Corps test pilots. And if you've ever been in the military, you know about pilots. They're a complete different cut. They have a different orbit. They're in a different universe. God bless them. God bless them. And uh, most of the NASA guys were test pilots out at Edwards Air Base, or what used to be called Lake Muroc. And it's risky business. And they're what would be considered hot shots. They were hot shots. Charles Duke was one of those and applied for NASA program and got accepted. And next thing you know, the guy's walking on the moon. And uh, when Charles Duke came back from the moon, he went into a deep, deep, deep depression, anxiety, and discombobulation of his life. That's his own testimony. He said, as he speaks now to church and Christian men's groups, he's still alive. He says, look at it this way, guys, gals. He says, how do you talk walking on the moon? What, what, what do you do? When you're a young man, you know, astronauts young in their 20s, early 30s. What do you do when you're that young? What's, a, what's ahead? What, how do you talk walking on the moon? How do you talk that? He went into depression and just things discombobulated. And finally, some NASA <coughs> engineers that were believers and some others that were believers approached him and told him that he needed Christ. He needed God. Because see, the conventional was that when you're a test pilot, you don't need nothing other than your own skill and intuition to not crash. Well, he had crashed his personal life after walking on the moon. He accepted Christ. He became a believer, and he became verbal. He went verbal. Amen. I love it in our church when people go verbal for Jesus Christ and talk about their faith or invite people to church. You know the majority of people that come to church aren't just going to walk on. The majority, most of them will come because somebody already there invited them. And often the newest members and the newest Christians, they got a network of unchurched, de-churched, or post-church people, and there's a ready place for them to invite them to come to church. And somebody invited me to church when I was a young man, lost. And as Paul Harvey said, you now know the rest of the story. I'm here. Amen. Charles Duke said this after his salvation and in his talks to men's groups, promise keeper groups, and church groups. He said, 
The most amazing thing in life wasn't that a man walked on the moon. The most amazing thing is that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, walked on the earth. Not that a man walked on the face of the moon, but that God himself, the I Am, walked on the face of the earth. John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him. He bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. I told you at the beginning of the service how Buzz Aldrin, when their watch will land him on the moon, first thing he did is he got a little packet from his, I guess it was a little survival fanny pack that each of the three astronauts had a personal stuff. And he had one of these little Lord's Supper kits with the wine and the wafer. And he took it there on the moon. And then he read a Bible verse. The Bible verse he read was John 15, 5, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in Christ and Christ in them, they will bear much fruit. For apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Amen. House on the moon, the man on the moon. And then, and then, when they were ready to depart, he read another set of scriptures. Well, there he just read one scripture. Now, he didn't have enough room to bring a Bible or a New Testament, so on a three by five card, on a three by five card, he wrote out John 15, five. And then he, on, the three, on that same three by five card, he wrote out Psalms 8, 3 and 4. Very appropriate for having been on the moon or leaving the moon. He says from Psalm 8, 3 and 4, When I consider your heavens, talking about God, the work of your fingers, the fingers of God, of course, metaphorically speaking, when I consider your works, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, God has set the planets and the stars in a season, and there is a message in them. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and you may not realize it or not, but many of the constellations act out the gospel of Jesus Christ in the sky. Amen. Unfortunately, we let astrologers with a bogus teaching on some things, hijack it. But God created the stars and the sun and the moon and ordained them as a messenger. And here it says, your finger, that the moon. And then verse 4, what is man? Hey, what is man? Hey, we just got to the moon. What is man that you would take thought of him or the son of man that you would care for him? God cares. God knows your name. God knows who you are. God knows what's in your heart. God knows your pain. God knows your failures. God knows your victories. He knows everything about you. And He still loves you. His love is perfect. His forgiveness is perfect. We see, we see here that... Uh, we see connectivity, vitality, receptivity. We are to receive the nutrients and the sustenance as the branches produce fruit from God through His Word, through Bible study, through our Sunday school class Bible studies, through preaching the Word. If the preacher preaches the Word and, and not psychology today or some reader digest story, I might use it for an illustration or a little back toy and things. But we see here the vitality, the visibility that you see it, the grapes on the plant. You see the grapes and they're ready to be picked and harvested. I'm talking about usability. Usability. All these things factor in. On the normal Christian life, we have connectivity, vitality, receptivity of God's truth and word, visibility. We go verbal for Jesus Christ. And then usability. God uses us. I'll never forget, and many of you know uh, my relationship with Pastor Rick Warren from Saddleback Church. I was the best man at his wedding. 
he was best man at my wedding and uh, many, many days, many, many mornings at Cal Baptist College where we were students together, we would meet at five o'clock in the morning and uh, put in, in the baseball diamond dugout and we'd pray. And we'd spend one semester, we spent spend every Monday through Friday meeting at five o'clock in the morning and knelt down at the dugout and prayed, Rick prayed, I prayed, and we, we poured our hearts out to God. I mean, it was serious, heavy duty praying. And I remember us praying. We first were praying, uh, we first were praying, God uses, God uses, God uses. And, and I was praying that God would use me to preach the gospel all over the world. He's answered that prayer. And the best part, the last part of my ministry all over the world is here at Harbor. And the best part. We pray, God, well, we pray, God, use me, God, use me. And then later, our prayer was this. Instead of praying, God, use me, we pray, God, make me usable. Amen. God, make me usable. Wow. We see connectivity, vitality, receptivity, visibility, usability. Look at, look at in your bulletin there on the sermon outline, this uh, no fruit, fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Look at this progression. Often our Christian life is like that. There's no fruit, nothing visible. Nobody even knows that we're a Christian. They can't tell. There's no, no difference. There's no fruit. But then all of a sudden there, there's fruit. Then there's more fruit. Verse 2, verse 5. Much fruit. Much fruit. So I want to take a look. I, I want to take a look at this... Uh, no fruit, more fruit, fruit, you know, uh, get fruity duty, oh Rudy, remember that other song? <laughs> uh, well, verse 2, it says, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. This concept, this idea of uh, the, the, the branch, the Christian, the believer, that is not productive, not fruitful, uh, yeah, you don't even know that guy's a Christian or the girl's a Christian or uh, what does God do with them? Well, here's something very fascinating and stay with me on this. And I said I might have a wrong interpretation because the majority interpretation is something different. That's the dynamic of the Word of God. It is so rich. It's like a diamond that you look into and you see the many facets and the many colors when you put the light upon it. But here it said the one that has no fruit it says here he takes away. That word in take, that word take away in Greek is the same word he lifts up. He lifts up. So there could be two meanings. It could either be tears out the branch or lifts it up. The picture we've got here that I want us to see is a, a grapevine and the branches heavy with the fruit have fallen down and are down in the mud. And they're dirty. And they're down in the mud. And the husbandman, the gardener, the curator, the vine dresser lifts them up. Puts the little bandage or the little twine and then rinses them off. Perhaps this is what Jesus was saying here that when we fall in the mud, when we're stuck in the mud and our fruit gets all covered with dirt and filth and our testimony is not as effective as it was that Christ will lift us up put a spiritual vaccine on us hold us up clean it up notice he prunes it I want to ask you this morning how much fruit and visibility of Christ likeness is in your life as I close as I finish up let me talk about what is meant by fruitfulness in the Christian life. Well, when we talk about Christian fruit, what are we talking about? Well, there's at least four things for the message this morning. Number one, winning lost souls is fruit. The fruit of Harbor Christian Fellowship is people coming to know Jesus Christ. Amen. Young men and women, boys and girls out there, having gone through our school, through Kids alive through our children's church, through our church that found Christ and they're out in the world productive. We have tons of them that went through our school. 
I run into them quite a lot in the community, and they're all over the place. Uh, fruit, number one, is winning other souls, winning lost people. Proverbs 11, 30, they that win souls are wise. Second aspect of having Christian fruit is not just reproducing ourselves. By the way, does not the vine and the branches and the grapes, they reproduce themselves? I mean, the chain continues and continues. By the way, let me tell you something dirty, ugly, and nasty. You might not want to receive this. So, you know, I'll give you a second to stop your ears. No, no, I'll tell you what, I can't even hear myself do that. The Christian church is always a generation and a half away from extinction. The gospel, evangelical, true Christian church is always a generation and a half away from extinction. Extinction for if people don't share. Don't produce fruit. Don't win others to Christ. Don't bring in the next generation. Now, sure, the institutional, bogus, phony, baloney, antichrist driven, institutional church will always remain. It's there. It's phony, baloney. Plastic, banana, good time, rock and roll. But the true church of Christ is always a generation and a half away from extinction if Christians don't share their faith, if they don't follow the great commission. Some follow the great omission, but it's the great commission. By the way, it's a command, not a suggestion. So fruitfulness, number one, is winning the lost soul. Number two, Christian fruit is holiness in our life. Romans 6.22 in the King James Bible says that it, the fruit is the holiness, the the fruit is holiness in our life. Now, what is holiness? It's part of that integrity, being whole, holy. Literally, the word is in the Greek language and Hebrew language to be different, to be set apart. The normal Christian life is to be different than the world. When the world says, oh, there's eight or nine, ten, twenty genders. The Christian that is holy says, no, there's not. God created the male and female in the book of Genesis, and the word of God abides forever and changes not. We're different. Christians are the most radical, rebellious people that there ever was. They don't go surfing on the same waves as the world. In fact, they go the opposite way. They're almost like salmon. They go the opposite way of the other fish going up and and things. To be holy means to be set apart. It means to be different. And it's not so much about a set of do's and don'ts. God gave us the real do's and don'ts. So, you know, don't put too much stock on man-made do's and don'ts. It's the do's and don'ts that God said. And by the way, the Bible is more do. do. Dude, some people think that when you go through the Bible, it's no, 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 no. It's go, go. Yes to us. Amen. Fruit is new Christians. Fruit is living holy, clean, set apart. Just being different. Being different. Number three, check this out. Blow your socks off. Fruit, Christian fruit, is financial support into God's kingdom. That's in Romans chapter 15, verse 28. When you put that envelope there in the offering plate, when you give, uh, that is fruit and fruitfulness. That is fruit. It is fruit. Romans chapter 6. Now, by the way, uh, Romans is a very big theological book with theological concepts. And uh, not only does it deal with theology, it deals with neology, and it deals with giveology. When I was pastoring First Southern Baptist Church in Las Vegas, and I always did the offering uh, as they came up and did an offering scripture and uh, they took the offering. There are many times that I quoted the scripture, God loveth a cheerful giver. God loveth a cheerful giver. And then I'd say, but God also loves grumpy givers. So whether you're cheerful this morning or grumpy, give. Amen. I get grumpy when I can't give enough. 
or can't meet my tithe that week, and I have to kind of, you know, delay it for the next two, put in the next two offerings and cash up and, and stuff. But did you know that our giving is a fruit? It's Christian fruitfulness. And then, number four, this is the bottom line, it's Christ-likeness. It's being like Christ. Being like Jesus Christ. Talking like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, acting like Jesus. Being Christ-like. And there's steps to Christ-likeness. It's called spiritual maturity. And it doesn't happen overnight. Now, no maturity. Any of you that are mature, any of you that got your first letter from AARP, or have been getting them for 20 years or more, or your Social Security, or on Medicare Plan A, B, C, Z, what, 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 you know, it didn't, it, it took you a long time, 65 years to get there. And maturity, by the very nature of maturity, it takes time, it doesn't, we can see, we always want the instant fix. We want the instant zapola. And then now, spiritual. We're not even talking about spiritual. We're not even talking, we're talking about just being a normal Christian, connected to Christ, having his nutrients and supplements in our lives. It's Christ's life. It's, it's maturity. It takes time. It takes time in the Word of God. I challenge you to spend time in the Word of God every day, even if it's just one chapter, one psalm a day. Time in our Bible study. Well, some of you are not in any real organized, systematic Bible study in a group. Why would you come to our Sunday school classes here? Oh, Sunday school's for little kids. For little children. No, it's not. The Bible doesn't say only little children read the Bible or know the Word. We're to be in the Word. We're to be saturated by the Word of God. We're to be drenched by God's Word. Amen. That is the normal Christian life, not what we see today. Vance Havner had said that the Christians today are so subnormal that if they ever got normal, they would be extraordinary. I mean, uh, Christ's likeness. And that is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's like a cluster of grapes, uh, except fruit is not fruits, but fruit singular. The fruit is for love, joy, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance, against such there is no law. They're intertwined, they're interconnected. Possibly you can't realistically, Christically have one without the other. But I challenge you this week to go look at, we well, see the scripture here, Galatians 5, 22, 23. Take those nine, and by the way, it's, this is a really fascinating number nine. Uh, you know, I meant to true biblical numerology, not the wacko stuff. But the Holy Spirit often is symbolized as what? A dove. A dove has two wings. They are the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They, the, the, they, they have nine feathers. The doves have nine feathers on each side. There's nine fruit of the Spirit and nine gift of the Spirit. And then the doves don't have a gallbladder. We have too many active gallbladders in a lot of our churches today. And people are upset, they're angry, their feelings are hurt. I think back to Paul, I think back to the scripture and what those Christians, I think back to what the early Baptists went through, killed and drowned and executed and what it took to build the freedom that we have in America to worship. Worship and freedom, uh, Christ like. So let me close with the secret. It's abiding and hanging in there. Now that's the secret. The whole sermon in one sentence hanging in there with Jesus Christ, our connection with Him. Amen. Without Him, we can do nothing that lasts for time and eternity. Oh, we can do a lot of things. We can build in the flesh. We can build what the scripture calls wood, hay, and stubble. Those are all burn. Silver, gold, precious stones. Fire, let's just be purified and even stronger. I praise God that this church is not a church that builds on wood, hay, and stubble, but on the precious things of God, the gold and the silver and, and the foundation stones and the truth historically. And I want to continue that in the time that God allots me here. Last of all, best of all, the Christian life, the normal Christian life is a life of faithfulness and fruitfulness. 
So as Marlon and Sadie and Greg come on up, uh, I want to do a spiritual checklist. We're going to do a check up from the neck up so there's no stinking thinking in our minds. Okay? Is that okay? Is that, is that fair enough? Amen. And, you, know, um, you know, usually when uh, you go to the doctor as a child, you know, what's the first thing the doctor says? Stick out your tongue. You know, because that little popsicle. You know, well, we're going to have a checkup from the neck up. Three things. A spiritual checklist that you see at the end of the uh, sermon notes. Number one, am I looking like Christ? No, I'm not talking about long hair and a beard and sandals. And by the way, you know, this might make your heart sick. I don't know. I don't care. But back when I was a student at Cal Baptist College, after I got into the military, where I had to have the high and tights, I let my hair grow. Huh? It grew past my shoulders. I looked like a roadie from the Leonard Skinner band. <laughs> you know, my best friend and buddy, Rick Warren, his hair was even longer. They were canceling some of his youth meetings because he had too long hair. <laughs> and I cut mine in case you got to fill in for him. <laughs> so now I can say I filled in for Rick Warren and I filled in for Billy Graham. Oh, wow. But looking like Clark, no, it's not long hair and in a robe and wearing sandals. But do you, you love the spirit of Jesus Christ? Do you look like Christ? Amen. Can they see the praise of God's love on you? Second, are you living like Christ? I'm not just talking about Sunday around us here. But in the dark place on Monday or midweek, you know, or when some bad stuff happens, are you looking like Christ? Are you living like Christ? And last of all, are you loving like Christ? Amen. I pray that you take this message as Jesus from his word personally talking to you. And if you're a branch that needs to be lifted up and pruned and hosed down and cleansed so that that fruit is visible and the fruit doesn't get trampled and crushed in the mud, I challenge you between you and God. Take that verse 5. The verse that was read on the moon on a three by five card 20 years and one day ago. Lord, you're the vine, I'm your branch. I want to stick with you, you stick with me. And I want fruit, I want fruit. And Lord, without you, I'm nothing, I can do nothing. Because Jesus Christ, you are everything. Amen. Let's stand together for just a time of commitment. We'll have an altar call, perhaps right where you stand. You need to commit your life to Jesus Christ and say, I want that Christ in my life. I, I want that. What I've tried is a dead end. It's empty. I've done it all. I've tried it all. It's all empty. I've tried the world. It's all empty in the end. I need something. I need Jesus Christ. You can commit your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're looking for a church home, a church family. Has God led you here? Maybe you just want to recommit your life right where you stand to say, Lord, use me. And maybe pray that prayer we prayed. Lord, make me usable. Don't pray, Lord, use me. Pray, make me usable. God just may wear you out in answer to that prayer. Of course, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's sing. You commit. Step out. Tell me your decision, and I'll sit you down. You won't have to say anything or make a speech. Maybe you just want to join this church. You come if God has spoken to your heart. Safeway or Ralph's or Bonds or uh, Sprouts and you buy a bag of grapes uh, and when you munch down I want you to think about the vine and the branches and how Christ will lift us up out of the mud and cleanse us and prune us and make us usable and that there be fruit, more fruit and much fruit.
All right, before I pray for uh, dismissal, we do have a business meeting after uh, church. So go ahead and take five minutes and stretch your legs and come back and we'll do God's work. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We can come and worship you and we just uh, thank you for the words that you provided, Pastor Danny. And we don't want to be dead wood. We don't want to be dying branches. We just want to live for you and, and reach people for you. We just ask that you be with our, uh, us at our business meeting so that we might do work that brings you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. glad you joined us today and uh, we hope this was a blessing to you and made you go out and bless others as we blessed you and we'd love to hear from you tap high or you enjoyed it or if you have any questions or if you have any prayer requests or concerns that you'd like to share we'd love to hear from you here or you can call our church office which is posted and uh, if you're in southern california we're about uh, 15 minutes south of disneyland stop in and join us we have bible study midweek and uh, the Iwana program for the kids. Uh, we have Kids Alive starting in the fall, which will be for the uh, Christmas musical. And uh, we have a ton of stuff going. Uh, we also have a Filipino service at 1 o'clock, and we have a Spanish service at 6, and we also have a Persian service, too. Stop by and say hi. God bless you, and praise Jesus. God bless you.